there's an old chestnut that often gets taught to Sunday school students as they read that passage we read this morning from the Gospel of Luke. When reading this passage, people kind of naturally wonder, well, who are these Sadducees who come and talk to Jesus? And the explanation that is given often goes like this. Well, the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in life after death. And on one hand, that saying is true, but on the other hand, I think it gives a false impression because it implies that they didn't believe because they were sad. You know, that they were kind of like spoil sports who didn't really believe in anything. Maybe even suggest that perhaps they were proto-atheists who didn't even believe in God. And I just wanted to let you know that if that's the impression you get, well, it couldn't be further from the truth. Do you want to know who the Sadducees were? They were actually members of some of the most elite, wealthiest families in Judah. I mean, life was good for the Sadducees. And far from being atheists, they counted priests and high priests among their families in great numbers. So they made their living basically by serving and sacrificing to God. And the reason why they actually didn't believe in the resurrection is, well, because they saw themselves as good Bible-believing Jews. But, see, here's the thing. The Bible that they believed in was small and well-defined. See, most Jews at that time would have recognized the whole of, or pretty much the whole of what we would call the Old Testament as Scripture. But the Sadducees, they were much pickier, you see. For them, only the first five books counted as Scripture. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the so-called books of Moses. And they noticed something about those books. The notion of the resurrection didn't really come up in those books. Like, not at all. Doesn't come up because nobody's really concerned with the afterlife. People like Adam and Noah, Abraham and Moses, are totally focused on this life, not the next one. And God's promises in these books are very much focused on what happens here and now and in the generations to come. In fact, that's not just true for the first five books of the Bible. It's actually true for a great deal of the Old Testament. The question of a meaningful afterlife doesn't really come up. Oh, you'll find it a few places in the Old Testament, like in the prophecies of Ezekiel and Daniel, for example, but those books were written pretty late. In the oldest Hebrew literature, the idea is not really there. So in many ways, the Sadducees were just trying to take the Bible seriously. And after all, isn't that something we're all supposed to do? Now, of course, that doesn't change the fact that in the time of Jesus, the Sadducees were pretty much the only Jewish, Jewish group that did not believe in the resurrection. So, obviously, something had changed for most Jews by that point in time. But that change was not primarily based on their reading of the scriptures. So where then did this conviction in the afterlife come from? Well, it turns out I can tell you exactly where it came from. It came from a story. See, about two centuries before the time of Christ, something horrible, terrible, happened to the Jews living in Judah. They were ruled in those days by the Greeks. Perhaps you've heard of a fellow named Alexander the Great and how he conquered the whole world. Well, one of the places that uh, Alexander conquered was the land of Judah. And generations after Alexander, 
the descendants of his generals ruled over the Jews. And one of those rulers was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes was a bit of a jerk who was really full of himself. And he was having trouble in his rules with the Jews that he ruled over. And so Antiochus made a fateful decision. He decided that the problem he was having was actually to be blamed on Jewishness itself. And so Antiochus set out to fix his problems. He did not set out like some other tyrants in history who I'm not going to name. He did not set out to kill all of the Jews. No, his policy was not traditional genocide, but it certainly was cultural genocide. And so Antiochus decided to exterminate all Jewish practices, like circumcision and the, and the kosher diet, and this strange habit they had of worshipping just one God. And so he made all of these things illegal. <laughs> but then, much to his surprise, the Jews did not appreciate his policies. They resisted. And so the king had to up the stakes. And that leads us to the story that changed the Jewish percep perception of the resurrection. All Jews, except for the Sadducees. It is a story that is told in the second book of Maccabees. Now, 2 Maccabees is not a book that is in our Bibles, but it is in the Bible of Roman Catholics and Orthodox Christians. And according to this book, the king, Antiochus, arrested an entire family of seven brothers and their mother. They were arrested on suspicion of, well, acting Jewish. And the king brought the whole family before him and demanded that they each eat a bite of pork. But the brothers refused. And what follows is a story so bloody, so graphic, that I actually could not tell it to you. I mean, you can look it up, read it for yourself. It's in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, if you want to know the story. But be warned, it is graphic and bloody. But the story basically says that the king had all seven brothers tortured to death. And the torture that he inflicted was particularly bodily as he cuts off the various body parts of these brothers and roasts them over the fire. And so all seven brothers die, and the woman, their mother, dies then as well. But the bloody details are not really what's important about the story. What's important is the reaction of this family. It really stands out. Because, of course, they are there on trial because they do not want to betray their faith in the face of the king's decree. They are there because they trust God to save them from the king. And at first, their faith leads them to believe that God will save them from what the king wants to do to them. Because the only promises they know of God are promises for this life. That's what they have learned from their scriptures. But of course, that's not what happens. And one by one, the brothers are painfully put to death. One by one, they watch horrified as various body parts are lopped off and thrown in the fire. And God does not save them. And so they are left with a choice. Either, either God's promises have failed, or, or they need to understand God's faithfulness in a new way. And so this terrible holocaust that they are put through convinces them that if God is faithful, well then God's promises must also extend beyond the present life. And if, if their enemies destroy their bodies because they remain faithful to God, well then God's faithfulness 
and justice must mean that God will give them their bodies back again. And they believed. They came to believe in the midst of that torture that if God had been able to create them in the first place, well then surely God could raise them up again and create them as new bodies at the end of all things. And so it was that a belief in the resurrection of the dead was established when people heard this story of this family and what they had experienced. And by the time of Jesus, this belief was accepted by the majority of Jews. Except, of course, for the Sadducees. And of course, all of that makes it kind of hilarious when a group of Sadducees come up to Jesus one day and try and convince him that he's wrong about the resurrection, and guess what? They do it by telling a story of seven brothers and one woman who all died. They tell the same story. And I'm sure they thought they were being clever, but the story probably went over with the crowd like a lead balloon. Because, see, everybody in that crowd knew the story of King... What's his name? <laughs> King Antiochus and, his seven and the seven brothers. Everyone in the crowd believed in the resurrection because they knew that story. And the Sadducees thought... They'd found one weakness in that story. Ah, they said, if only one of the brothers had been married, well then, he couldn't be raised from the dead. Because that would have broken one of the obscure laws in one of the books of Moses, because it would have meant that each of those brothers would have had to marry the same woman, and then when they were raised, well, she'd have to be married to all of them. That's their argument. And it's a ridiculous argument. And I'm betting that Jesus and everyone else were laughing hysterically as Jesus gave them his answer. But you want to know what the Sadducees really got wrong? They were trying to do their best to respect the scriptures, the letter of the scriptures as they knew them. They forgot one key thing. See, the scriptures are there to point us to the truth. And the truth they point us to is not merely laws and doctrines. No, the truth they point us to is the far greater truth of who God is. And that's what Jesus said to the Sadducees. He spoke to them about who God is. He spoke of how God is the God of the living. That God is a God whose essence is found in love and life itself. And the complete knowledge of such a God can never, never be contained within the pages of a single book, no matter how extraordinary. No, instead, what the book does is it points us to the experiences that others have had of God. It points us to the experiences that we can potentially have of God. Because it's actually only through human experience that we can come to know God. Because human experience, it's all that we have. The experience of the Jews, the, the, pers the persecutions they had in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes led them to an incredible new insight that God would raise up the righteous from the dead. In the same way what the first Christians experienced of Jesus, how they experienced him still alive after he was crucified, that taught them to trust in the God who would raise them from the dead. But when we limit ourselves to what we find in the written word, when we allow it to dictate our experiences, we will never know the true fullness that God wants us to have the knowledge of God. Today is Remembrance Sunday. And on this day, we do remember 
all who suffer through the trauma of war. We remember those who went and never returned. We remember those who came back broken in body and in spirit. And we mourn the loss and destruction brought upon the whole earth as a result of war. It is an opportunity to recommit ourselves to doing whatever we can to build a just and peaceful world where there is no war. And I hope we can certainly commit ourselves to learning the lessons of wars and conflicts past. Because they say, those who do not learn from such histories are doomed to repeat them. In the fires of their affliction, the ones they suffered under the Greeks, the Jews discovered something important about who God was. They discovered that God was committed to them not only for this life, but beyond this life. And they learned that the God who created them would give them new life. What have we learned as a result of our trauma, as a result of the wars and police actions and peacekeeping that we have been involved in? I would certainly hope, as a result of our involvement in World War II, that we might have learned something about the dangers of building our nationalism out of various ideals of racial purity and excluding the ones who are different. Yeah, you would hope that. Sometimes, looking around today, I wonder if we're forgetting that lesson. You would hope, based on our tragic experience in Afghanistan, that we might have learned something about using religion, any religion, as a tool for motivating terror and hatred. You would hope so. But I wonder what we have learned. But by far the most important lesson that we can learn are lessons about God and who God is. And I do know, I do know that many learned to have faith in God in the midst of the trauma of conflict. And yet at the same time, I also know that many learned in the same kind of conflict that the image of God that they had been given was inadequate. Both of those lessons are equally valid. Both of those lessons are essential. You know what I believe the error was that the Sadducees made? They seemed to think that, because they understood a book, they had come to the end of the, an understanding of who God could be. Oh, they had a wonderful book. But the problem was that they believed that that book limited who God could be. And Jesus challenged them to open their minds to new possibilities of who God could be for them. Even in the midst of the worst traumas, traumas of people's lives. I suspect, however, that maybe the Sadducees were a little bit too comfortable in their lives. They had it too good. Too many things were going their way. So they were not open to learning anything new about God. And that, that is kind of sad, you see. Gracious God, thank you that we never, ever come to an end of learning who you are and who you can be for us. Amen.